Hello and welcome to our weekly Gold Hill online service. My name's Dave and I'm part of the leadership of the church. And my name's Natalie and I am the youth worker. It's really good that you could join us here today. I want to make sure you know where to go to find out anything you might need to know about what's going on at Gold Hill. If you head to goldhill.org forward slash info, uh, then that's our weekly info page, which uh, will tell you all the things that are going on in the church and also give you all the links you need for various services and Zoom gatherings and different things that are going on across the course of a Sunday. It's also our month of prayer this month, and I don't know about you, but I've been really enjoying getting involved. Um, if you are following along in our booklet, then that is great. Um, if you haven't yet followed along in our booklet and you want to join in, it is not too late. So all you need to do is head to www.goldhill.org forward slash get in shape and you'll be able to download it and just see what else we've got going on there. Fantastic. And one of the things that is going on across this month of prayer is we've set aside one day each week as a day of prayer and fasting. Fasting is just going without food or something, but normally food, uh, in order to focus ourselves on prayer and on how much God has given us. And each week there's a different theme for that. And this week, the theme for our, our fasting day is going to be praying for our world. And we want to do that right now. So I want to just encourage you to think of a place in the world. It could be somewhere that you've been. It could be somewhere where you have family or friends. It could be somewhere that you've been reading about or hearing about in the news. But somewhere in the world that is important, that's on your heart, because it's definitely a place that's on God, God's heart. He cares about everywhere in the world. And just take three or four minutes now to pray for that place. It doesn't need to be fancy. doesn't need to be clever. Just pick a place in the world and pray for it now. Let's all do that together for a bit.
Well, let's pray together. Father God, I want to thank you um, for all the different countries around the world, all the different places that um, have been named um, today by people um, around this village and beyond. And God, we thank you for all of those places. We thank you for um, people in those places and um, all the different cultures, all the different countries um, that were prayed for. God, we just lift them um, to you, especially in um, these, these days. So I pray that you'd bless them. Um, thank you, Lord, for um, all the prayers going up today. Um, and thank you, God, that you are a God who hears us when we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to hand over now to Fiona. I'm really glad to be able to introduce her. She's been putting together our, uh, our time of worship this morning. Uh, she's been drawing on different things. And rather than me try and introduce that, I'm just going to hand over to her and she's going to introduce us and lead us. Do follow as she leads this morning. Over to you, Fiona. Hello. I'm wondering if you'd like to just read these words with me this morning. We are not once a week friends. We're the family of God. We are not a cosy club. We are the body of Christ. We are not just strangers meeting. We are temples of the Holy Spirit. We are not here by accident. Our Father has called us to worship. We are not just filling up an hour. Jesus wants us to know him better. We are not just going through the motions. The Holy Spirit has some special words for us. So come, draw near to God, and God will draw near to us. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're with us today, wherever we are, wherever we're meeting you from. And I just pray now that you'll come by your Spirit and guide us and direct us in these next songs that we're going to sing. May we be a blessing to you in the, in the worship that we bring to you. And then later, as we hear your word, please speak to our hearts. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.
still be my vision, O ruler of the heart of, the heart of my own heart, whatever be still be my vision, O God is able, he will never fail. God is with us. God is with us. God is on our side. He will make a way. Far above all we know. Far above all we hold. He has done great.
Well, today we have Jackie, who is going to be speaking to us um, from the Bible. So if you haven't got one with you, now is a great time to run and grab your Bible, whether it's on an app um, or a physical book, um, you might need that this morning. I'm going to pray for, uh, for Jackie, but also mostly for us as we listen, uh, that we would be able to hear and respond to what it is that God is saying. So let's pray together. Lord, I want to thank you that you are a God who speaks. Thank you that you speak when we when we read your word, when we read the Bible. Thank you that you speak to us by your spirit today. And I pray that you'd be doing both of those things over the next um, little bit while Jackie is sharing, that you would be stirring in us and you would help us to know not just what you're saying, but also how we can respond, how we can live our lives differently, how we can become uh, different and become stronger 
as a result of what it is that you have shared with us. So I pray for all of us during this next time. Would you speak to us and would you give us hearts and lives that will listen? Amen. Amen. Over to you, Jackie. Hello, everyone. It's good to be with you today as we consider another aspect of Get In Shape. It's a good subject as it's often at the beginning of any year that people review their lives and think about how they want to make changes, stopping old habits so that they can start better ones. The thing is that deciding to change is not always easy. We might all be aware that the percentage of people who start out with these plans don't continue. Maybe because they haven't weighed up the cost to know how much effort or time it takes or how it will fit with the schedule of their day. But what has been seen is that if we're motivated by a reason beyond ourselves, people will keep going longer. If you know a charity or an individual will be impacted negatively by your giving up, you may keep going longer. What is going to help us make the changes to shaping up? We've had teaching over the last few weeks on the importance to get in shape, to get in shape physically, financially, and and last week, spiritually. The thing is, we're not trying to make changes just for ourselves because we'll become better people, but because we believe that we're being encouraged by God to make these changes. And when we line up ourselves with God's values and ask how he wants us to live our lives, how he wants us to spend our time, the money or resources he's given, when we care for our bodies and focus on linking closely, like the branch of a vine into his strong root, then we're people who flourish. Those changes give us a life of abundance, as Jesus talked about, people who have a life of abundance who flourish. We may not always see it or feel it, but that sort of life brings God glory. What we do reflects on him. We therefore make these changes because we want to live in a way that glorifies him. One of the habits I've started in the second lockdown was encouraged by one of my family, and that was to increase my level of physical activity. She said, if I do this, mum, will you? So we keep each other accountable. We agreed and each time we do an exercise programme, we send a photo of a hot perspiring face. And that's another way to keep motivated, to have a buddy, or in my case, a daughter who's keeping check on me. And that leads me into today's shaping up, which is all about shaping up our relationships. Getting our relationships in shape really can glorify God. And we read in the Gospel of John that Jesus said these words, By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. These are challenging words because Jesus said that not only will people think it's nice if we love others, but that we will see that they will see our behaviours are different and make the link that it is because of our relationship with God that we behave in this way. People will see and recognise that it's not typical. Today's passage is written by that same John who wrote the Gospel of John. And now, later in his life, when he's an older man and probably banished to the island of Patmos, he's writing a short letter to a small group of people in a house church about the importance of loving. But as we'll hear, this love did not mean they could just continue in the way they were living in all respects. John brings a challenge to them, as well as some encouragements. So let's read the letter called To John. The Elder. To the chosen lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth which lives in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Father's Son, will be with us in truth and love. It has given me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as the Father commanded us. And now, dear lady, I'm not writing you a new command, but one we have had from the beginning. I ask that we love one another, and this is love that we walk in obedience to his commands. 
As you have heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. Many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch out that you do not lose what you have worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God, and whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take him into your house or welcome him. Anyone who welcomes him shares in his wicked work. I have much to write to you, but I do not want to use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to visit you and talk with you face to face so that our joy may be complete. The children of your chosen sister send their greetings. I find it fascinating and, if I'm honest, a bit sad as I read various commentaries and chatted with a friend about this short letter that the first verse has brought division amongst Christians. John starts off by naming himself as the elder, which is understandable as he is an older man, but he addresses the letter to the chosen lady and her children. And that's been understood differently by biblical scholars. I don't see we gain much today by going into that discussion deeper, but simply to note that it often saddens me that when we as believers differ on the meaning of a part of the Bible, it's in the tone or the language of such conversations that we can detect if the people love one another. Too often in my experience, the differences discussed are held with such passion that it seems it's more important to those discussing that they prove their argument rather than show respect for a sister or brother who differs in understanding. That's not to say, as we've read in the second part of this passage, that we just roll over and don't stand up for key truths, but it's still so important, the manner of our discussions. Personally, I have no problem accepting that this older man, this man John, who has walked alongside Jesus in his younger years, wrote words of affirmation to a lady who is overseeing a small church in her home. We don't know where that chosen lady and her family live, but what is happening in her home has got back to John and he needs to spell out clearly a few things as a warning. He's clearly not harsh in his drawing things to her attention, but knows it's vital that the key truths of the good news are not changed. He starts by being really encouraging. He's heard about her children, about how they are living well as followers of Jesus, and this brings him joy. There he is, isolated on the island of Patmos, it's believed, where he writes the book of Revelation. And he has had messages about this small church of how they're walking well with God, and it brings joy. But he goes on, and he needs to remind her of the need to not sway from the old commands of God, to love actively, to be totally obedient to all that Jesus had told them about how they should live. John had heard Jesus firsthand. He'd been there. He had witnessed Jesus' ministry and he knows that picking and choosing what the followers of Jesus are now doing is just not right. Now, possibly as soon as I talk about obedience and commands, I could imagine that some people listening right now want to turn off, click onto a different YouTube sermon or church website because the feelings that are evoked when I use words like commandments and obedience sound so negative, so restrictive. And who likes restrictions as we all know and see right now? All around us, we're seeing people push back on restrictions. The government has given restrictions and we don't like them. This dislike of restrictions starts early in our lives. Have you ever watched a toddler told not to do something? Tell them not to touch and what do they want to do? They want to touch. Putting boundaries around them makes them push against them. They want to be in control and that desire to be our own boss doesn't go away in many of our adult lives. Listen to the radio, watch the news feed. All the time we hear the equivalent of, I decide what's best for me. I decide what's true. I decide what's the way to enjoy myself. 
I suspect that whatever any powerful body, whether a government or a teacher or a parent says, the one on the receiving end will often think they know better. But when you argue back and you're arguing against God, that is obviously foolish. Unless, of course, you don't believe God is there. Well, John knows God exists. He knows that God is not harsh. He's not a bully who wants to order people for the sake of it to get them to obey unnecessarily. Here we have an older person in the faith telling a younger person what they know works based on the fact that the one who told them they have seen is utterly trustworthy. He has learned that the commands of Jesus are not harsh, but edges of kindness, so that love from God to people flows in the best way. He knows it's important to warn this little house church of people in verse nine against those who say Jesus wasn't human at all. It was a heresy in that part of the first century called doceticism. Their philosophy was to say that Jesus couldn't have been truly human, that he didn't really suffer like any other human would because he was God. But John knew. He'd been with this man. He knew Jesus was fully flesh as a human man. John had stood at the base of the cross. He'd seen the reality of agony. He can't let that absolute lie of the docetics continue. He tells the chosen lady, these people must not come as teachers into her home, to the church that meets there, and that they mustn't stay in her home, which would have been given credence to the lie of their message. This wasn't just a small difference of opinion, but a lie that distorted the core of who Jesus was and the basis of how he could save people. That lie needed to be illuminated and stopped. Now I said earlier that there are often different parts of the Bible that people don't agree on as to what they mean and strong arguments arise. But this core truth about Jesus being a real human man is not a topic that can be either accepted or dismissed and for the person to be allowed to stay in relationship with them as if it saying that it doesn't matter. This truth does matter hugely. That may sound harsh in a worldview like we live in where absolute truth is disputed. But as Christians, we do have core beliefs about the nature of God and of Jesus, who was both human and yet had come from heaven. What may seem foolish to the people of this world is in fact so true. Another leader called Paul in the early church said in 1 Corinthians, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. John is warning the lady and the church not to give up this absolute key truth. I listened uh, to a biblical scholar last week called Charles Swindle, who was talking about truth and love. He gave an illustration of what happens when truth is watered down. He spoke of what happens when torrential rain falls and the ground is saturated and the water level rises. And often rivers then become overwhelmed and break their banks. And the previously clear water soon gets mudded, bursting over the top, causing devastation to all the surrounding roads, homes, carrying everything in its path, just like we see and have saw last year in the UK. He spoke, Charles Swindle, that love is like the river and the banks need to be truth and discernment. Love to be pure needs these boundaries. When it flows out beyond them, then actually what may be called loving is in fact dangerous to those who drink of it. Have you ever tried to play a sport? or watch a game of something where people didn't have the rules. It becomes mayhem. Every sport or team needs clear definitions of what is accepted and what is not. Good team players know the rules and in the same way, good churches know the boundaries and they know they are there for good and for the purpose of the game, which isn't for us, but the purpose is to spread the message out 
But to do that, we need to be clear about what the message of love and truth is. So it's therefore important to know what Jesus gave as commandments of love. What did he teach by his life and words that showed what love looks like? Let me just give highlight a few of these as we read them in the Gospels. We know Jesus spent a lot of time on his own, up early or late, in quiet solitude with his Father. The key to living out good relationships with others is first and foremost getting our relationship strong with God. Jesus knew his Father loved him and it was because that love mattered more than any other that he had a wonderful way of not being moulded by what others wanted of him. He listened to his Father. He obeyed him even if the actions he was asked to take wouldn't be appreciated or understood by others. For us, building that relationship above all others is wisdom. And investing in relationships that strengthen you as a branch is so important. This older wise of follower needed to help the younger one. John is doing this with this lady. It's a brutal world in some respects out there for us and we need the wisdom of those who have journeyed longer. Young, ask the older how they've kept their faith alive. And us olders, let's be willing to talk to the youth. We will see the world differently to our society and we need to stay together in good fellowship and relationship. We know that no church will be perfect. But the Bible makes it clear that all followers of his need to stay connected with each other because his message is challenging and if we live like Jesus, it won't be easy. Jesus built relationships with the sinners, those tax collectors, the women, other men despised. He saw that they were sick and distant from God and he wanted them to know God's love. He showed them by his time and attitude, that he had respect and love for them. We need to be willing to go to where some of these sick people are in our society and invest in them, not as a project, but with ongoing relationships. Jesus taught about caring for the weak of society. And some of those people are definitely outside, but there are also people inside our church And love needs to be shown inside to those who are struggling too. So if you're looking to invest in relationships, then caring for others, then that's a good call. To look out for those inside and outside the church fellowship. What else did Jesus teach? He spoke about the importance of forgiving others so that relationships could be restored Oh, this could easily be a sermon in itself, but we see by the many stories Jesus told about forgiveness, how vital it is for those who are his followers that they follow the command to forgive one another. This was a huge cry, is a huge cry of the Father's heart not to judge others harshly. The greater our understanding of how much we are forgiven, the easier it is not to judge, but to forgive quickly. Many of you listening will know the story Jesus told called the prodigal son. And in that we see the father longing for a restored relationship with his uh, wayward boy. It mattered so much to him that we see him standing, watching, waiting for him. The father, when he sees the son, doesn't want to hear the rehearsed and sincere apology. He just wanted him home. Jesus tells other parables that people who are forgiven should be people who forgive. In many of our relationships, we get to choose if we release others of their wrongdoing to us, not necessarily because they deserve it, but because we too have acted or spoken wrongly and we've been forgiven so we can't really justify finding faults in others. Today you may have people in mind that you know you aren't in good relationship with 
And perhaps this is the day to do your part as much as it depends on you to reach out. I would suggest you ask God to give you his view of that person. Did they perhaps speak or act badly because of pain they're carrying? We don't get to live another person's life with all their baggage or their hurts, but we can make wrong assumptions about them. We can judge them harshly from our perspective. And God's view of them is full of love. So let's ask to see them through his lens, his standing. The people who John warns this lady about think they're right, but from God's perspective, they weren't. And so the lady is told to stay away. So Jesus isn't saying it's okay to embrace all people, but our hearts need to be loving. We need to know the truth of how God calls us to live. And when we're uncertain, we're called to be people who discern what is the loving thing to do. This book, the Bible, is our key way of knowing what is God's way. When Queen Elizabeth II was crowned in 1953, there was a significant moment during the coronation ceremony when she was presented with a Bible and told by the Archbishop of Canterbury, we present you with this book, the most valuable thing this world affords. Here is wisdom. This is the royal law. On my wedding day to Andy, my grandparents gave me this Bible. And my grandfather wrote in his beautiful handwriting these very same words that I've just read. And then he added, God's wonderful revelation, giving guidance for life and all that you need. Here is truth. Read it daily, for thereby your life will be blessed. I haven't always done that. In fact, when we were first married, we were very young in faith and we didn't know the value of reading the Bible and that took time. But God was kind and kept nudging us to read and learn and live differently. Building good relationships as individuals or within the church and also outside of our faith community means we need to be people who know God more and more and choose to let go of our rights and trust that in living life his way, we do get to have an abundant life. But greater than that, our lives show God is truly at work and gives him glory. So I challenge us all to do as my grandfather said, read this book, not to make a study document, but to know it's written as a book of guidance so that we can keep the strong banks and then our love for each other flows with greater purity. It's a lifelong journey that we need each other involved in. If we were gathered in a building today, I'd finish by asking that we link arms and pray for help to love lavishly and generously like Jesus did. Well, we can't do the physical linking up, but we can imagine other people in our fellowship and people we love and still pray. So let me finish by praying for us that we would shape up to be people with relationships that mirror the way Jesus lived his life. Let's pray together. Oh, Father God, we thank you for sending Jesus. We thank you that he loved and loves lavishly and generously and keeps on loving us even when we foul up and mess up. And we need Holy Spirit, you to help us to do that because we're weak and we often judge others and find others irritating and we don't find it easy to be in relationship. So fall on us, fill us Holy Spirit, that we would shape up to be people of good relationship so that your glory will be shown so that the people of Chalfont St. Peter and surroundings would question how come these people love each other like this. We pray that the way we love, the way we do relationship, will in fact draw more people to know that you're the God of love and your love is never ending. It's a never ending river 
and it's bounded with truth. So we pray your truth will go forward as we live our lives this week. Strengthen us, we pray, by the banks around us, which are your arms. Amen. This is my desire to honor you, Lord, with all my heart, I worship you.
Well, our time together is drawing to a close. We're really glad to have had you with us and hope and pray that God has spoken uh, and that this has been an encouragement to you today. If you are joining us today and you haven't normally joined us or wouldn't normally uh, go to church, then we would love to encourage you and invite you to Alpha Online, which is a Monday evening. Um, and if you go to goldhill.org forward slash alpha, um, all the details on our website for joining that course. Alpha is a course which is basically a chance to ask big questions about life and to explore something of Christian faith with other people. It's definitely not too late to, to join in, so do head to that if you'd like to find out more. And with that, uh, we, we draw our, our service to an end. Uh, if you'd like to be in touch, if there's anything we can do to support you, or you'd just like to have a conversation, then drop us an email at office at goldhill.org. But for now, we'll say goodbye. And thank you so much for joining us. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.